Hi everyone, thanks for coming to our talk on artistic discourse beyond the market. Um, we have today our speakers Stephanie Burt, Ho Tzu Yen and Philip Pirot. I'm going to very quickly introduce our speakers to you and then I will let them begin the discussion. So our moderator Philip Pirot is an art historian and curator who is also the Dean of Stedel Schuller and Director of Porticus in Frankfurt am Main. Next to that, he serves as adjunct senior curator at the UC Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive and as visiting professor at the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Pirot is preparing for an exhibition with CCA Singapore opening this March entitled Arus Balik, From Below the Wind to Above the Wind and Back Again. And we have Stephanie Jane Bird, who's an artist whose practice spans from sculptural installations to fictional prose. She completed her studies at Glasgow School of Art, where she received her Bachelor of Arts in Painting in 2012 and a Master of Fine Arts in 2014. Her work invites the viewer to explore dialogues between her installations and their settings through a fictional narrative, at times referencing film and literature. Ho Tzu Yen is an artist who, who works primarily in film, video and performance and has recently developed environmental multimedia installations. He has also written extensi extensively on art. He earned a BA in Creative Arts from Victorian College of the Arts, University of Melbourne and an MA in Southeast Asian Studies from the National University of Singapore. Please give a warm applause to our speakers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Eric. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, Audrey Yeo for inviting us, and Amy from STPI from for uh, convincing us and me uh, to do this talk. It's very interesting that the last talk on an art fair is finally given to the artists. <laughs> it's like everybody else, all the other professions have passed the review already. Um, so this is the first and the last talk with artists. Um, they both have been presented. I'm very happy that uh, Stephanie and Sun Yen uh, share this panel with me. It's a bit of an, an odd thing because we didn't know each other very well um, and we didn't in exactly know what would be the um, common denominator to talk about on an art fair. But there is maybe something interesting that was experiencing the last days and also in conversations with you both and it's about uh, I'm just back from Jakarta and I assisted a conference and lots of people be them artists or um, more in the curatorial world were talking about refusal and about disappearing and about flight lines like ways to kind of like evade that there is no alternative idea of an economic structure and uh, find strategies to um, create an alternative, to exit the machine, to um, kind of like not be delivered to being this combustible for an ec a certain economy, although we all realize that this economy might be necessary to a certain point, but it's like rather an unease we all experience in how we are mobilized in that economy. And Gabin Zobo, a South African curator, said something very interesting. It was like, how can we keep our humanity? You know, like how are we not necessarily becoming or forced to develop our own brand, etc., etc. So I don't know if it's maybe a bit of a surprise to start like that, but maybe it's interesting to, I think it might be very interesting to hear about your practice, that maybe the work a lot of people know uh, or not, but how you work. And in the longer, maybe in the longer logic, what is an ideal of distribution of your work for yourself? Like thinking outside of the confines of an, how an art system functions. Who do you address and where do you want it to arrive? And where do you start? I don't know if that's a, I don't know who wants to start, maybe. Uh, uh, hello? Very close. Hello? Oh, okay. Um, that was like a very, uh, quite an interesting topic to begin with. I think that actually when I first started my practice, I never ever thought about galleries. Actually, it was um, I actually made a lot of outdoor site-specific work, and I think it was only um, upon returning this. And it was very funny because when I was in 
when I was in school or when I was like in university, my college professors would always say to me, oh, but Stephanie, like, you got to think about your future. You know, how are you going to sell this, blah, blah, blah. And then I would always be like, oh, um, I don't know. I haven't thought that far. So it was kind of, uh, it's only upon coming back to Singapore that I sort of started thinking about these things. But I think sort of where I began with my practice was completely um, experimental and sort of going to different sites and just sort of setting them up and documenting them. Um, so I've, I've definitely come a long way from that. So I think that where I am now or what, what I am still sort of, um, sort of thinking about a lot is also create, sort of retaining that experimental itch, but also thinking about it in a term of like, you know, a gallery sense or maybe like, how do you, uh, how is this perceived for the market audience and things. I think those things were definitely there when I came back to Singapore. And obviously, since, um, oh, if you don't know, I'm represented by your workshop. So Audrey, <laughs> Audrey also, you know, invited me to come to this talk. Um, but uh, yeah, working with her and she's also pushing me to sort of think about those things. As well. So, but what could be interesting when you talk about how you started to work is like a very maybe stupid basic question: Who did you make it for? Ah, when I you go in public space, and what was the what was the kind of address? Or who, which kind of encounter? Or was there not? Was it just something? I think I wanted to be to be quite ephemeral encounter, like where people would see it just for that, like so long as as it was there, like a day or so. Um, and then it would just be torn down. I think that was like, that it was never built to last. I, th I think that was quite important for me because I think that highlighted a lot of things that I was interested in or I am interested in, in like sort of fleeting moments and chance encounters and how those moments are, you know, it, nothing is quite as real as the first moment. Oh, that sounds so romantic. Um, but yeah, I think that was like what I was sort of interested but in. But your work still has that quality I th of yeah. uh, the risk to, it's a certain precariousness, mm -hmm. uh, it risks to collapse. Yes. It, it kind of embodies that risk also. Yes, Yeah. Definitely. So in that sense, it's also like a, it defies consumption. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I don't know. I don't oh know, I think it does, um, which makes it very difficult to market. <laughs> and very difficult uh, for potential collectors to collect. So I'm still figuring that out. If anyone has any suggestions, <laughs> if you want to tell me how I should help this, um, yeah, I'm free to like chat about this later. But yeah, a lot of my practice sort of started um, with it being ephemeral. Like, I, yeah, no, it wasn't And, and would, you, would you still imagine an ideal arrival that is outside of like trying to have to compromise or, or not compromising but trying to what you just said find out how to uh, present oh, in gala. is there an yeah. other type of distribution that you would like if if it's not if the market wasn't necessary mm. for your work is there is there some space you would imagine um, where the work would arrive on its own conditions almost mm. um I actually been thinking a lot about film as well recently, which is quite surprising, but um, that's something that I've been thinking a lot. But I think also I would like to, yeah, I don't know. I need to think about that some more. I, I definitely have been thinking about it for quite a while, but I haven't reached any sort of like concrete conclusion yet. Yeah. Maybe we can go to Tsun Yin. Um Yeah, I think, uh Probably our, our experiences are a little bit different and this is uh, where the age difference is showing a little bit. I think um, I probably started uh, working maybe a decade earlier than you. So my first work, uh, which was a, the first exhibition I had in Singapore, was a video piece. And this was in 2003, and the video piece is called uh, Utama, Every Name in History is I. It's about the pre-colonial founder of Singapore, the namer of Singapore that um, very few Singaporeans know about. So in 2003, it, it never crossed my mind um, to approach a gallery to, to work on this project. It's uh, the thought of uh, showing in a let's say a commercial gallery um, 
was, you know, it was not even within the sphere of my consciousness. So the project was uh, commissioned at uh, the substation. But um, even at that point in 2003, I was very conscious uh, of, uh, or I tried to be conscious about audience and distribution. Um, because um, the, the people who were interested in these kinds of art practices that go to the substation um, is an important crowd, but it's also very limited in size. Um, whereas, uh, I guess, uh, back in 2003, when I was uh, younger and idealistic, I imagine that the work was important for like the whole of Singapore and like everybody needed to see it. Like um, I needed to find a way to reach the schools and the children, you know. Um, so what happened was that I, I began, after the exhibition, I began uh, doing a series of talks about the work. So I, I took extensive documentation and the talk was one hour long. It's almost like a virtual tour of the exhibition and I would be narrating some of the, the histories and stories that I was interested in. So this talk uh, began, began to be packaged as a school talk. So schools uh, were interested in, in getting me to talk because they imagined it was about history, you know, so it seemed educational, which it was uh, partially. Um, so that opened a new kind of uh, a, a way to distribute the work for me, which is also to say that for me, the work Utama is not actually the video or the paintings or the installation constructed around it. For me, Utama was always a set of discourses, a set of ideas, you know. And, and these ideas for me could be reconfigured in, in different channels just to reach the widest uh, possible audience I could manage. So the film component of the work, the work when I first showed it was a painting, uh, was 20 paintings and a film. Um, so for the film, I actually uh, distributed it with uh, Objectives, which is a local film distributor. And this film was uh, collected by many, I mean, of some schools, uh, universities. So I was also interested in the film, in film itself as a distribution network. So my practice now, uh, looking back from 2003, uh, doing the, the, the lecture was my encounter with performance, uh, with staging. And uh, I was first invited into um, sort of uh, live uh, performing arts festivals to do this lecture that I did for school children uh, about Utama. So film, uh, which I also dabbled in a little bit, also came out from that project. So I think there was this consciousness uh, on my end to, to explore every single possible distribution network. So my next project, um, which is called Four Times, Four Episodes of Singapore Arts, was four short films about four different Singaporean artworks from four different generations, beginning with uh, Chong Su Ping, uh, one of the so-called Nanyang pioneer painters. And the last was uh, Lim Zhe Chun, um, I guess a kind of contemporary artist uh, closer to my generation. And uh, for this work, just to be very quick uh, about it, um, I was commissioned to, to make a project. Uh, at that time, it was called the Singapore Art Show. This was the pre-Singapore Biennial kind of like lead up. It was the experiment, I think, for, for the Singapore Biennial. So I was given a, a, a reasonable sum of money to do anything I would like to. And I used the commission money to buy airtime uh, from, from the national broadcaster. Uh, at that time, it was uh, Channel 12, I think. or it, was, it later changed its name to Octo. So I bought four half an hour slots on prime time um, and I developed these four short films with a production company and we sold the film to the broadcaster. So we made money and I had much, a much larger budget than I could if I had, than if I had stuck to the usual arts uh, funding. So 
um, the work was eventually uh, broadcast on national television. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that up to now, I think uh, for me, making a work of arts, uh, the art is not only the object, it is, it is the entire field in which one inserts this object into. So sometimes the field one might feel is not ready or there is no grounds for this. So I, I imagine it was the, the work of an artist, uh, or what I saw as my task to produce this field. You know. So one has to think about the distribution. Um, so what we are saying, I guess, is as important as how or where we say it. So, I mean, these were kind of the ideals I had. But I think it's a very different approach, Completely you know? Different. It's, uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I think you, it's a, I don't know, we were talking about generational difference, but there's not such a big gap. Yeah, he keeps going <laughs> on about it, you know. <laughs> and it has a, but yeah. it's, it's maybe, you tie in two different traditions. I think Tsunyan you tie in really this tradition from the 90s of art as archaeological research, knowledge also, the, the, the practice of like um, digging up knowledges that have not their evident channels to arrive and, and that was typical a cert, a documentary turn in the 90s using the formality of conceptual art to bring up other narratives, you know, uh, adding narratives to it, and I think you, it's, a, it's something indeed maybe a generational uh, difference, it's like this interest again in a more, you know, an, an art dispositive that is more opaque, that doesn't so go so actively searching to be distributed, etc., but that counts much more on a chance encounter with somebody, with a viewer or a potential public. And I remember in the 80s, in Europe at least, when I was just starting to look at art, it was amongst us younger kids, the coolest thing to go to see things you wouldn't understand. You know, like where you were sure that it was not going to explain itself or and, and how to deal with that. And that changed very fast. It was the end of the 80s. I had still the chance to experience this kind of almost performative encounter with art in galleries in Cologne it was. We were living in Antwerp and then we would drive there and it was like a whole procession from one gallery to another and see all these things that nobody explained and that were not explaining itself. But it's, of course that was then. It's, uh, and then afterwards this whole new impulse came of more I can't say the didactic, but research-based, uh, etc. I think you are much more working within, uh, um, I don't know how to say that, but this kind of like, it's an artistic language within art, so to say. Yeah, I think that's quite interesting. Yeah, um, yeah artistic language within art. Um, I really like that, what you said, like, oh, we will go and see shows that you wouldn't understand. Um, I think I felt that probably more when I was in college, I think. Yeah, more so than I do now. Yeah, but I think that there's always this sort of spark of excitement or spark of the unknown which you can't um, really place your finger on and I think that's always what makes it sort of interesting or exciting. But um, I really liked what you said about the 4 times 4 program on Channel 12. Yeah, um, I thought it was really like interesting that you actually went about that sort of road instead of going via the usual funding sort of. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that in some parts grew out of a certain necessity. You know, just in terms of thinking how one is to continue producing work, yeah. how one can expand one's budget. You know, for example, just so that you can try out different uh, technical. Uh, experiments that you are interested in. So, you know, looking to expand one's budget as well, I mean, it's uh, all quite practical, I, I would say. But I think for us at that time, for me, I mean, uh, there was also a, a, a certain uh, wariness of the, of the official channels of like communication. Um, for example, in Singapore, where um, 
much of the media, let's say, uh, has a certain uh, is disciplined by the state. Um, so there is a certain kind of engagement, like you know, the question of the public and and to expand the public. But I think I also was from the generation in which we still remembered or we lived through uh, the so-called uh, ban on performance art, for example, in Singapore. So these questions of what is public, what is allowed into the public sphere and what is not, you know. So I, I saw all of these as part of the art um, problem or the art projects, you know. Tying into that, um, maybe it's very interesting what you both as artists, um, how do you relate to this difference between the private or the commercial and the public realm and what is there, is there a difference in approach whether you show in a public institution or in a gallery, um, what do you expect from them it, or is there not a difference in approach, would you work in exactly the same way? Um, is it important for you that which type of uh, place it is in the sense um, do you care whether there is a difference between a public and a commercial realm uh, where where do they have to stand and maybe to come to the point what do we expect from institutions from galleries we kind of know I, I, I think for me Thinking about gallery, um, showing in a gallery space, strangely is a new problem or new question for me because I've um, only actually really started working much more closely with galleries in the last uh, two or three years. So this is also, you know, uh, kind of the, the trajectory of my career, uh, which was... Um, you know, my adventures kind of, I guess, led me somewhere else uh, for, for, for a decade or so. So this is a question that I, I've been uh, having. Uh, I mean, I don't really have any answers uh, uh, yet. Um, but I increasingly, I mean, I, I, I see that the, the markets uh, in Singapore, I mean, one can say many different things about the markets, um, but I do think I do at least see that it has a liberational, liberatory potential for, for Singaporean artists. But this is, again, speaking from my own experience, where much of my projects were state-funded, um, working closely with institutions. So the, the presence of having a market is a certain kind of freedom from those forces. But of course, uh, having the market uh, thinking about the market, you know, that's another set of forces. So, you know, it's it's still something I'm, um, you know, it, it's not something that I necessarily reject. I think uh, there is something kind of productive and interesting um, that could come out of it. But I'm still kind of um, trying to see how I will fare with this uh, game, I guess. I think I work the same way within galleries and institutions, but I do think that with, because I built them quite on site, my installations, so I think that with institutions, there always is a certain amount of how much you can do to the architecture, or how much you can sort of change, especially because for my practice, I sort of built sculptural installations on site. So definitely for that, there's always a little bit of a push and pull, um, and a bit of compromise that you have to sort of navigate. Um, as yeah, with galleries, as with the sort of um, market factor, I think I'm also still navigating that as well. Definitely, yeah. It's interesting, you both answer very much in relation what it can do for your work, or what it, where it threatens your work. But maybe if we inverse it, like, rather than from the gallery, as I said, we know kind of what we expect from them, but what, and maybe specifically in Singapore, what what would you expect from the institutions rather than just be a venue or a place to show but, but kind of more in general what uh, do we need them how do we need them and and what is their do they have a corrective potential yeah 
Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, in institutions, I think, um, I mean, in many ways, uh, the, the institutions is already kind of part of uh, the whole assemblage, you know, of, of how I think about my practice. Um, I, I think today it's, it's um, uh, the people working in the institutions and the institutions, of course, continue to have a very crucial uh, role in, in Singapore. Um, you know, I think uh, w one can list a whole uh, number of uh, reasons for, for their importance, but one of the key things I, I would think of is that um, the institution remains a, a, a key player in, in mediation, in, in mediating between the public and, and the artist, which is also to say in redistributing the work. Um, the institutions still have a role, I guess, in deciding uh, what is visible and what is not. You know, I mean, uh, they still have the, the, the authority uh, um, to place your works and to frame how it is to be understood. So I think today we live in a time of like immense uh, changes, you know, like um, with uh, techno technology, for example, um, you know, the frame of how we understand vision, how we understand images, how we understand ideology is uh, shifting so quickly. And I think uh, artists are also um, trying to respond to these shifts. And I think people working in the institutions, of course, have the, I, th I guess it's part of the job to also follow up with this and to continuously think about how to, how to mediate arti artistic practices. So, I mean, for that alone, I think institutions still kind of play a very key part. I think the market in, in Singapore, if, if, I mean, I'm not someone who knows a lot about the market in Singapore, I, I have to say. Um, but from my kind of distant ob observation, I mean, uh, in, in Singapore, sort of uh, engaging with like contemporary arts and, uh, you know, collecting videos, or, you know, works that are non-paintings, etc. I mean, all of these are quite new, I would say. Um, you know, so sometimes uh, one has to think about the kind of the communication process uh, between the collectors, the public, uh, the institution and the artist. So I think there is still this uh, e ecology which is kind of very important uh, and the, these kinds of exchanges uh, should definitely still be sustained uh, now, I think. Yeah, I think the institutions still, uh, like Tunyan said, I think they are quite important in sort of, sort of building that bridge between the public and the private sphere. I think that, you know, uh, for someone who's also making work that is very hard to collect, I think institutions are also quite important for, well, a place for me personally to showcase my work because, um, you know, um, I'm also like a bit of a risk taker for a lot of private galleries. So I think like institutional, for me, institutional support is quite important and also a place where, you know, people can come or access the work and attend talks and attend sort of um, workshops that may be part of the sort of exit the show or however it is and I think those little things are actually what I kind of enjoy the most as well actually yeah you both talked about the idea of your the aspect of both of your sort of work that it's very hard to market um, maybe this is a bit of a tricky question but do you think public money should help private or public money should in fact help those kind of artistic practices that are not necessarily so easy marketable because that's another kind of thing that happens now in the since the world sadly or not officially has no mirror anymore it's kind of like global capitalism we live in I see also the tendency that money from ministries of cultures uh, is channeled in the private uh, cultural sphere instead of like creating the difference 
of like, okay, covering those things that are not covered by or taken up by galleries or taken up by a market. So it's like, where is, but you already, Sunyan, you said something interesting that the market could be liberating on one hand, but then on, I, I tried to turn that question. Is it not maybe mm, something we have to demand from the public realm to invest much more in those things instead of like helping the private? I think kind of uh, this follows up a, a little bit from what I was saying earlier in terms of the, the, the speed in which artistic practices are changing today. You know, just uh, for example, if we look at uh, typical international art uh, biennale today, you, you, you know, maybe you encounter a hundred works and in these 100 works, you have works about mining in South Africa, you have works about um, the firewall uh, internet problem in China. You know, you have um, a work that deals with uh, thinking the relationship between fossil fuels, ecology, and I don't know monochrome painting. You know, so just today, you know, the 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 ideas that um, a lot of contemporary artists are engaging with are is is extremely wide and. Um, artistic practices or certain strands of artistic practices are also becoming um, quite dense, I would say. Um, and it's still a, a, a question how we think about these types of work, which is, uh, as you said earlier, you know, very kind of research-based, uh, almost uh, didactic, we could say. But I would say that didacticism is a, is a form you know, that, that the artists uh, work with. So m many artists using technology, for example, you know, so these, be these practices become kind of increasingly, I would say, uh, uh, maybe difficult to, to understand uh, at one immediate kind of like encounter. So I think uh, the institutions play a really crucial role in building the context around these works, you know, so that maybe the artists, um, are freed of the task of having to explain themselves so much, you know. I mean, this is kind of my desire uh, ultimately for, for, for the institutions in Singapore, which is to say that one hopes that the institutions are at the cutting edge uh, of, of all these um, experiments and thoughts. This was interesting because we talked about that yesterday too, Stephanie, about this pressure to explain, the pressure to legitimize, the pressure to kind of like be your own educational department, so to say. Um, yeah, how do you think of that, you know? In um, based on my personal, yes, what, absolutely. yeah, based yes. on personal experience. I'm not trying to be biased or something, but I found it uh, particularly more difficult with the Singaporean public, just in terms of like how to, you know, they will ask me, so uh, why is this ribbon tied to the shoe? You know, then I'm like, uh, there's no, I can't give you a one plus one equals two answer most of the time. It doesn't work that way. You know, so I just try to position it in a way where uh, um, maybe I'm asking a question. Maybe you can think about the questions that the work is asking rather than trying to find the answers. But I feel like after a while where you constantly... Um, come up with these sort of uh, when you constantly are bombarded with these questions like oh but then the story say is like that but then your installation do like that then like uh, not like you know then I'm like uh, <laughs> sometimes the, the, the stories or the films are like uh, sort of um, a board where I leap off from so I create from that context or you know it's not necessarily that you know, the green in the story is going to equal the green on the table. And I think that like, those things are still, I think, this, you know, it's quite hard for me to, what I feel personally that I, this is the part that I struggle with the most in with the Singaporean public rather than when I, you know, obviously when I've exhibited abroad or when I've done uh, shows abroad, I don't think um, this has popped up as much. Um, just this particular Effect. And I think that's where, like Tunian said, I think the institutions, or we can hope that the institutions can be more cutting edge and are actually, I feel like they also hold a lot of responsibility in trying to educate uh, the public or how they view art, I think. 
it comes back to the beginning, this idea of like how to deal with things we don't understand immediately, you know, mm -hmm. like it's like, mm -hmm. it's another language, mm -hmm. if, it's, mm -hmm. if it's a language at all, you know, like mm -hmm. it's something else, it's another practice, it's outside of, outside of discourse, it operates. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a habit, it's not only Singapore, it's a habit that has been lost. And I think it has a lot to do with, since art became much more a mainstream point of discussion because there is so much money going around in it, mm -hmm. it had to legitimize itself much more. And people start to ask these questions. Mm -hmm. um, because it's all the question of what is in fact the excuse for the value? You know, like the monetary value is the one that is happening around and that what maybe a broad public understands there is apparently money given to things people make but it has to lend a, it from a symbolic value and that's where you know that's I think the reason why this increasing amount of legitimation questions come like for a practice that is kind of like trying to do something outside of immediate communication mm -hmm. you know just to just to jump in as well on on your example, of course, uh, I've experienced uh, having been made to explain my work as well, so I share your, your feelings uh, very much. But sometimes I think it's also interesting to, to, to flip the question around and think the other side, you know, which is why is it that this particular set of audience don't seem to understand what we are doing, you know? And I think that's always also for me an interesting kind of exercise because I feel that in that answer somehow is folded our history, uh, which is the, the history of Singapore's development as a society, uh, which is to say folded in it is the post -col our colonial, the colonial question, you know, and also I would say a class uh, question. Why is it that certain audience seem to be able to understand a particular kind of uh, language in arts? You know, that's because they have access uh, access to this, uh, which I think is facilitated very often by your class uh, in Singapore. You know, so just to give a kind of a funny example, maybe. Um, I remember when the National Gallery first opened in Singapore a few years ago, I would hear from my friends in the National Gallery that like, they, they always speak with horror that the public is touching the paintings. You know? So for a long time, you would hear all these horror stories of that. So uh, I, I, again, I would like to flip that around. And uh, sometimes I think, you know, so what is it in us that assumes that all the audience knows that it is not right to touch the paintings, you know. I mean, after all, museums these days uh, highly encourage interactivity with uh, artwork, you know. So, why, why do we assume that this frame for this kind of proper behaviour or understanding exists everywhere? I think, you know, this is absolutely a class uh, question for me, you know. So I think at the same time that we, we are troubled by this, it's also sometimes I think interesting to think the, the other side, you know, and, and somehow I think uh, when we make a, an artwork, you know, the, the work doesn't exist in a vacuum, you know. It is immediately tied to existing forces and is plugged into, into the political and the historical. So. I think these are just kind of interesting kind of questions sometimes to yeah, entertain ourselves with. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, now that you put it, as, yeah, I can definitely, I definitely agree with what you're, with the, how you flip the question back around. Um, yeah, and I guess so that kind of leaves us if, is it important or is it necessary for them to really understand? Or is it only necessary for a certain group of people to understand? Yeah, I and, and I think that leads to the question of how much we want them to understand. And also I think it, it, it then involves um, that when we are creating an exhibition or a show, 
how, how do we stage the show in such a way to, to, to achieve this desired level of communication, you know? So I think this also leads to the institutional kind of questions of like the curators that we work with, the formats in which we are exhibiting artworks uh, today, you know? I think sometimes we go to some art exhibitions and they don't want war text, you know, because it looks more elegant. And sometimes you feel that's missing. And sometimes you go to some institutions in Singapore and the war text is so long that you spend a much longer time reading the war text than, than seeing the work, you know. And, and that is still also a question. But all of these habits of exhibiting and presenting work seem to me to be from the last decade, you know. And, and all of these things are kind of interesting things to, to reconfigure or, or, or to experiment with, I think. You had, in, in, when you talked about your first work, a very uh, clear strategy to maybe, in that time, unconscious, but to reach as much people as possible, so also to overcome this class problem. Um, what do you, you know, is that, is that something that's also on your mind, the class uh, so society in, or is there, do, do you have also conscious strategies trying to overcome that, that your first works in public space would, could be a, an encounter for everybody, anybody, you know, that would be around. Is it something that's still on your mind? Because it's, this is a funny thing I read a couple of days ago, there is a German guy who made an app, which is a kind of Shazam for the arts, and some of the people in the gallery world really hate that because it discloses the background of works and it helps everybody to know everything in a second, you know, what were the auction prices, but also where it was uh, showed, who wrote about it, etc. And it's, I don't know if it's a very expensive app, but probably not. And they try to keep that out of the, the app world, you know, there has been uh, a trouble because, and he said like the art world functions as a caste system, like almost like in the Indian caste system. If you're here, you'll never get there. And it's probably the same for public, you know, like if you're, part of this you will never be part of that and that's also this kind of crazy thing that when you go to Venice Biennale or something that certainly when you're very young it's like how to get access to this palazzo or to go there or and it's that's the economy of it you know this access which is denied how do you stand as an artist in in this kind of reality I think actually um, my public art sculptures or the public sculptures that I did and they had access to sort of people from all walks of life, I actually found that a lot more interesting and um, I actually felt a lot more connected at times <coughs> rather than with a very specific group of uh, people or like you know certain um, groups of people uh, only if you're doing it for people in the art world. I actually found like that I took joy, I personally found joy when I actually had conversations with people. And sometimes actually, even if they don't really um, understand, I think they're quite curious and they're quite excited to learn. And I think that's the sort of difference. Like I think that um, no matter what kind of background you're from, I think that uh, there is a sort of like curiosity or excitement to learn more about the art and the artists. And, and I think that sort of little conversations that I, well, I personally have with them, um, I found to be quite uplifting. So I ap definitely appreciate that side of it. But I am also aware that I, I also thought about this a lot, but I will not um, sort of like reduce my concept in a way to make it accessible. I don't think that's going to benefit me as an artist in the long run because I think I also need to think about terms of my personal growth and how I can do that because I feel like if I do that then I won't be actually growing anymore as an artist and I don't think that will be good for the work so I think definitely there is I am you know aware that I enjoy these conversations and but I also don't need to retain what I do um, and not sort of like reduce it in any way. And I don't really know what other words to sort of replace. But it would also be like yeah. underestimating your public. You know, if you make it too, kind of yeah. consider it as an ex, it yeah. needs and accessibility. Yeah, and also I don't want to, because I think that sometimes, you know, different or maybe like good works of art always have different entry points. 
And I don't necessarily think that any of those entry points are wrong in any way. I think they are just different and different people read it in a different way. And I think they're all valid. And I think that's what makes a work interesting or sort of valuable is that it's quite multi-layered in that sort of sense. So I think that sort of uh, interests me definitely a bit more. You know, I don't want to be, um, I'm not trying to put myself in like, uh, like a sort of elitist way or anything, but it's just, I think that um, a good work of art will have many entry points. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's maybe time to involve the people here around. Um, we've been chatting amongst ourselves, but I think it's maybe the right moment uh, for some comments or questions. Hello, hi. Um, I'm a docent guiding at SAM and um, Human Barracks. Um, what I'm interested to know um, as an artist, um, because the Singapore markets, the collectors are regional, the regional collectors. And therefore, as, a, as an artist, you, you see, um, how do I say, the market in the Southeast Asia is huge. You have a lot of artists coming out of Philippines, from Thailand, from Indonesia, Vietnam, and, and you know, Myanmar, it's coming up. And so, but I see a lot of young artists in Singapore now because there's so many schools now promoting um, um, artists. You know, it's, it's, it's part of the government's um, initiative to encourage uh, more, um, more of its citizens going into the creative industry. No. But the, the market, in this uh, domestic market is very small and the collectors are regional. You have to admit it, they, they, they go around the world and it's, it's very regional in its, in its outlook. So as, as a young artist or, or, or someone is about to graduate from La Salle or Nafa or even Sota, right? And they have a lot of questions and they say, as a, as a, as a veteran artist, for, for instance, um, Ho Tzu Nian, um, I mean, you, you're very established, I see your work in Bangkok Biennale, in Chiang Mai, in Philippines, in Hong Kong even. But now in this market, and where competition is so much bigger, uh, what, what is your advice to this really young, um, you know, going to be graduate? And, and I mean, yes, y you do get a lot of institutional support because you are the pioneer in, in terms of uh, video installations and everything. Uh, but there are a lot more coming in now and they want to do filmmaking and they want to do this and they want to do that. And, and what is your advice going forward? What does the region look like? I mean, it's, it's not, and not everybody is it's going to say, you know, the government needs to support me, they need to give me the grants, you know. They need to go regional. They need to find, find a bigger space. So what is, what is your advice? I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I always hesitate giving advice uh, to younger artists just, just because um, I think artistic practice is, is so diverse today. You know, there are multiple modes of working and engaging with the outside. So what works for me or what I think works for me so far, you know, it might not benefit someone else. So, you know, in, in, in conversations with younger artists, uh, of course, one tries to share as much uh, knowledge as possible, but I think you also have to think about who you are speaking with. Uh, I mean, this is one thing. I mean, the other thing I would say that is, is that I think you, you said there's, there are so many artists uh, being produced out in, uh, in, in Singapore year after year. And I think, actually, I might be diverting a little bit from the topic, but I think this leads to a kind of an important infrastructural question, which is that, you know, there's a kind of an art boom in some sense, a so-called uh, art boom in the last decade or so. And we are producing more artists than ever as well as people working in arts management and you know, every year that's more and more. But one has to take a practical look at the infrastructure to see whether there are enough jobs that are also being produced with these institutions 
to match these uh, figures, you know, these students that are being churned out every year, you know, I think this is a practical question that needs some careful uh, uh, looking into, you know, so I'm div diverting a little bit. But just to go back to your question and, and um, about advice, right? I, I mean, so I can only speak on my own uh, and also like my own observations of some peers of mine uh, who's uh, sort of uh, kind of grew up and worked alongside me uh, in the last 10 years or so. I, I would say that somehow not, many of the these examples of you know artists or artistic practices in the region in Singapore that I admire and respect, a very few of them begin by thinking about the market. You know, so when they graduate, like the market is not the immediate pressure. I think the pressure is how do I make work that is relevant today, now, here, in relation to the world. And I think in many of the cases that I've been observing, the market follows. And I think this has to be the most healthy uh, uh, way to do, you know, rather than... Um, so when I started uh, in, back in 2003, I never had a question about market. You know, there was no pressure with the market because I assumed there was none. So one has to make one's market and, uh, and if you so get a sale... our generation is a bad advisor. A bad advisor. Sorry. I think there is a, something there too. Like in that time, there was no career. You know, like it was, was that a career? No. Certainly not 90s, late 90s, early 2000s. Like, what are we going to do? And I think that's maybe a difference now for people studying art now. There is what they see is all these careers. Yeah, but, but it's maybe an interesting. Do you consider what you do a career? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I also know that um, this is what I do, but how I make money, it's a separate thing. So, you know, I teach, but I enjoy teaching, so that's a good thing. Um, but I think that as a young artist, when you come out these days, you have to sort of navigate that thing between, you know, you know, they always say try to do something that, uh, the thing that you love, try to do it second, so you're not going to get bored of it, you know, and try to do something else that you're like okay with more. You know, that's what they say. I, mean, I can't like, you know, don't, uh, quote me on this. I think everyone functions very differently, but I think that definitely, like the we have to look at the infrastructure of what's happening, and yeah, that is a legit question and that is a legit concern. The amount of uh, jobs for young creatives that are coming out, and Singapore is also a very highly costly society to live in. So how do you navigate that? And also as a young artist, you definitely, you know, I always tell my students, oh, you guys should go and get a studio together. You guys should go and rent a place like somewhere and just make art together. Because I think that helps you, you know, as uh, not just that with your practice, but also to build relationships. I think those uh, friendships are very important. And I found that my friendships with people have been very integral to me. Um, and they've definitely helped me not just, you know, with my work, but also like personally and, you know, motivation. Because you don't want to be alone in your studio. I mean, if that's... It, by all means, if that's what you like, but you know, I, I think like how you can sort of sustain that again is the question that we all need to try and like figure out. We're all sort of navigating. I think that's that it is hard, and I'm not saying that it's not hard. And I tell my students like, look, it's gonna be hard. Don't think that it's like you're gonna come out into a candy floss world. I mean, to be honest, I think the Singapore's art scene has developed so much from, yeah, like 10 years ago when I first met you. <laughs> um, you know, it comes a, actually a quite a long way. So for what is going to like develop and how it's going to evolve is actually quite exciting, I would say, definitely. Um, so there are things to look forward to. But I think that those sort of struggles are real and they're real everywhere. I don't think it's just 
to Singapore. I think it's everywhere. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Is there any other questions or remarks? Uh, maybe just a question about your everyday strategies to make sure that uh, you're not tainted by commercialism in a way, like your everyday strategy in ensuring your independence of art thinking and also your evolution as an artist. Yeah, because participation in Benales and also having your exhibitions in commercial galleries may taint your mindset. Yeah, thank you. I'm also quite rebellious, la. so I also... <laughs> Every time I have to work with like Audrey, then she's always like, oh yeah, how am I going to sell your work? And I'm like, I don't know. La. I don't <laughs> I'm also, you know, uh, I'm quite rebellious in that way, I think. Um, but I think I, I can't say for everybody, but I think for me, um, uh, I can't make something that I feel not connected to or not um, sort of closely affinated with, if that makes sense. Like, I think that um, my work is also, you know, it's quite personal to a certain extent. So I feel like I'll be lying to myself if I did something else. But that's just me, la. you know. I yeah, I, I, I think for me, the ideal is that this, this binary doesn't really exist in that sense that, you know, like when I do, when I work with a gallery, it, it's commercial, you know. I, I think a lot of the galleries that I have uh, friendship or conversations with, they don't speak like that or they don't think like that. I think uh, a lot of these uh, meaningful kind of conversations and relationships with galleries is that these are galleries who are interested in what you are doing, you know, for who you are, you know. And, and I think this is the most productive uh, way rather than to get into the mindset of, you know, this kind of under siege, like, oh, this is, you know, like my art is in the ivory tower, you know. Uh, yeah, so I think it's, it's good to get out of these kinds of op op oppositions uh, today. And I, and I think, you know, earlier from our, the last strand of conversation is that increasingly, I think in Singapore, it seems like artistic careers have a certain kind of fixed patterns, you know, you, after graduate, you get a show in a gallery and you sell and you make collector friends and you go to the art fair, then you go to the Biennale and then it's the, the world or, you know. But I think these kind of steps, these structures did not exist, uh, I guess, so clearly when I was starting out. But I think these kinds of steps is also quite boring. I, I think, you know, just for that, I think we should try to delink and desynchronize ourselves from these types of patterns. You know, and, and I think very much part of the art, artistic practice, like I said again, is not about the object, it's about how you organize your way of life. You know, how but you There is maybe yeah. the, the friendships, you know, like, but not friendships as networks, but yeah. friendships as friendships yeah. that are very important. And how to, what you say, like disentangle from that pattern mm -hmm. to kind of like invent something else is heavily dependent on, on how you are solidarized mm -hmm. instead of networking. Because I think it's, it's just a very important thing that is also relatively new is this kind of like networked society, which is a career method, you know, and which comes together with technology today. Um, I think a lot of questions is like, oh, how can we step out of that or not step out but, or misuse it? You know, like how can we do that differently? Mm -hmm. And it's, and there is proven cases you can misuse it, but it's kind of like each time it still surprises as fantastic invention, you know, when, the, when it's misused, the, the so-called networked uh, technology also. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I think personally, like, I think uh, friendships or even, like, collaborations with people um, that wouldn't necessarily be in this similar pattern of a mode of production. Um, and I found it quite enjoyable. And I've also learned quite a lot of stuff. Even with people, I've also collaborated with people who are not necessarily 
artists, but maybe designers, and they just trying to do some bit of art on the side. And I feel like sometimes their perspective is very different from someone who is constantly, you know, working within the art world. And I think those fresh, fresh perspectives can actually sort of, yeah, give you a fresh take or you never know where those creative projects can go. You know, maybe they can go somewhere bigger or maybe they might evolve into something else. I think, you'd, yeah, you can't really um, predict those things, I think. I think right now we have quite a predictable way of thinking about producing work, but I think sometimes it's good to sort of, yeah, sort of mess that sort of production yeah. or the idea of that sort of production up, yeah. I think it's, it's good to see with the younger generation of artists as well, there's more endeavours like shared studios and also artist-run spaces. I think for a while, you know, this was kind of missing in Singapore except for Jason and his grey project, he was the lonely survivor. So it's good to see these alternative modes of um, practice, you know, and, and I think these practices, you know, in the end, could lead to new and I I interesting works, you know. So I, I guess we have to see things holistically or try to. Is there any more questions? Um, as artistic professionals, um, this is a simple one. Uh, how do you feel like your, like, uh, how do you feel that Art or your art in particularly, uh, or sorry, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, how do you feel like your your work and your practice enriches humanity? Sorry. How do you feel like your work or uh, the work that you do enriches humanity? That's a big question. Like beyond um, the in the intrinsic va value of art itself, or if you even feel like there is one, because I mean, as artists, we're constantly um, asked to justify our work to um, our audience and even to uh, people who may or may not like our work. Uh, we we like to think that it's defined by the art market. Um, by the price tag in, in art auctions, uh, even by the social connections that we make within the art uh, industry itself. But at its core, art really doesn't have any value. It's like money. It's, 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 it has a value that we ascribe to it. Um, do you think it's an, a purely emotional value? In which case, um, what place does that have in, in our world and our civilizations? Um, you know, I've actually been thinking about this quite a lot, yeah, recently. Um, and I think it's very hard because I think in Singapore, value has to be seen a lot of the time. If you cannot see it, it needs to be something you can hold. And if you cannot hold it, people cannot understand or sort of justify that, you know. So I think personally, um, I wouldn't speak for all artists, you know, but I think like personally, I go to art because it makes me feel less alone in the world, you know. And when I first started uh, making art, I made it not because I kind of like, I felt like I didn't have a choice because it was just who I was, you know. And obviously, you sometimes people make art to sort of cope with certain things, but obviously that matures and changes into a larger conversation you know, or like things or research that you're interested in. But I think for personally, my work deals a lot with uh, feminism or relationships. Uh, the, the research that I look at looks at relationships between mothers and daughters, female friendships, and sort of child psychoanalysis. So I think definitely, um, I don't want to be so like, oh, you know, it enriches humanity. I don't know if I can go so far to say that, um, you know, but I think that I personally would like I do this work because I would like um, to let other people know that they're not alone in struggling or thinking about these issues, you know, um, because that's why I go to art. 
Um, but I think that however they read it or however they want to sort of uh, understand or respond to that, um, I don't think you can put a value on that thing. It's not something that is can be seen, but it doesn't make it, I would say in my opinion, I don't think it makes it less valuable than a BMW car or something, you know? And I, I think this idea of value is so, it's not just that it's subjective, but um, I, I, it's just, it's not something that you can say, oh, I think this is valuable, it's not valuable, because people's inner life is so subjective and it, it changes from time to time. You know, you grow and you mature and things like that. But I think that from my work as I do, I would like to help young women or like, you know, uh, young teenagers to help to navigate the world in a healthier way. That's my hope lah. Personally, that's at, mo at most I can hope for because I can't really say or give them or try to make my art seem like it's an answer because I don't think I have any of those answers either. You know, does that make sense? Yeah? I does anyone recognize the irony that the work behind that talks about uh, that art talks are a bit too high falutin, and no, I didn't see this. Is oh, there? I didn't even know there was art, a because they locked up some artists uh, with that cable tie um, two nights ago. Yeah, they were they were locked up. They were they could not come out. So there's a bit of irony that we are having this conversation, and we are talking about beyond the market. And I'm shocked that we I don't I don't see artworks on fake news on Trump, on, on how the climate, or, and I don't see work that seems to address a certain immediate social concerns. And sometimes I think a roll of toilet paper on Trump's leg stuck on that, the platform up the staircase maybe is more high art than some of the rubbish I see. The problem with Trump is you cannot touch it because every moment, something refers to him, he gets richer. That's a, it's kind of like, it's an interesting theory that the problem with Trump is that he and his brand are the same. And he doesn't sell really something, he only sells the name. So the presidency was the best he could get for his business. And so that's, so it's better not to talk about him. You know, like, he, he decreases in value the least we talk about him. Because I'm an art collector, and frankly, if somebody had a shoe with a, a tissue, with with poop and tissue paper stuck on that shoe, I would buy that, you know. But I'm I'm not because I don't see the we're not addressing the market, but neither are we addressing other concerns. I'm just 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 raising things since we are talking about the irony of art talks. I, I think it's, it's also still a, a, a debatable question if the function of art or the only function of art is to respond that way immediately to current affairs, you know. I think there are many other outlets today. One does not even need to name it arts and it could circulate with much greater efficacy than this slow, you know, engine of arts, right? So I think sometimes, you know, for arts, it's... Um, one has to kind of take, a, at least for me, a, a certain kind of distance in order to think the, the future of this problem or the, the past, the untaught past of this project. So maybe the, 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 the effect, this, this uh, reaction is, is not as immediate as you, you, you uh, hope for. But nevertheless, of course, you know, these are perpetual questions for us, I mean, you know, this is what I think, but it's always a, 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 a question uh, for me, you know. I think uh, earlier the, question, the difficult question about the value of, of, of arts, I, you know, I think there are a few ways to kind of think about it. Um, I mean, I'll just hazard a few. Um, 
sometimes I think, uh, again, it's uh, specific to different practices, but today, um, the way in which I'm thinking about my art practice is that it's kind of, for me, a platform to connect things, you know, connect things that are not usually connected together. For example, uh, a connection between a road survey organized in colonial Singapore in 1839 to prison labor during the colonial period to foreign labor in Singapore today to algorithms in uh, the role that algorithms play in uh, disciplining society. So it's a way to kind of connect things, but through the connection, we, we, these days a lot of artists also increasingly rely on specialists outside, you know, there's no way we can consume so much information. So we also start to kind of build networks amongst uh, different thinkers. So, I mean, this is a very immediate thing in how I see one aspect of my work that goes beyond my own uh, enjoyment, is, is these kinds of uh, conversations. But at a very personal level, I, these days I also think that actually the value of an artist is that he persists, you know, for me these days. The, the fact that an artist could do a work that sometimes, even for myself, I might not get its immediate relevance of the work, but I see this artist persisting with what he's doing in 10 years, for 10 years. And I, and I think that this is something precious, like a rare flower, you know. It's uh, the, the persistence in, in doing what you want uh, outside of, let's say, these kinds of market or fashion uh, kind of pressures. You know, but maybe I'm getting a little bit old, so you know. So, so these days I see like that's you know in itself something of value. So I think there are many different kinds of value we can we can um, attribute to 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 arts. Maybe the last question. Well, it's not so much a question. Just to add on to what Ho Jingyan say, based on my experience. For his last two work at SAM, Pythagoras and the Five Star Justice, value to the society. We guided students through your work. And, and you know, we have guided adults, and adults look at your work, especially Pythagoras, and they go, that's so, that's so uncomfortable, that's creepy, that's loud. You know, but we guided 10-year-old students. They walk into your space, and they went, that's so cool. You know, and and they're, they're, they're just kids who've never been to an art institution. And that is the value of art, because intrinsically it is an emotional encounter, and it gives them form of who they are in their head. Art gives them form, right? And that makes it accessible even to a 10-year-old. And that's why I think art is amazing. If it's, I mean, art needs to be understood through context, that's for sure. But primarily, that emotional encounter gives that, um, that, that, that value. That is what value art gives, I think. Yeah. Maybe on that nice words, we can wrap it up. And I would like to thank uh, Stephanie and Sunyan for sharing the podium and Eric for organizing thank everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to Philip. <laughs> <laughs>